the uh, subcommittee will come to order. <clears throat> uh, today, the Readiness Subcommittee meets to hear testimony on the use of modeling and simulation to enhance military readiness. Uh, I want to thank our distinguished witnesses from the Department of Defense and Industry for appearing before the subcommittee today, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. As co-chairman of the Congressional Modeling and Simulation Caucus with my good friend Randy Forbes of Virginia, I am very pleased to have this opportunity to discuss how modeling simulation can improve training, reduce operation and maintenance cost, and increase the life cycle of weapon system. Our thanks go to uh, Joint Forces Command for providing the future immersive training environment simulator so that members could get a firsthand experience with the latest simulation technology. And I had a chance to look at the weapon and, and fire, and I just could tell by just that I'm out of shape. <laughs> but anyway, the military services have all, to some degree, invested in modeling and simulation to improve training, reduce cost, and improve the accuracy of budgeting and material maintenance projects. The services efforts va vary in complexity and change continuously as technology, tele, technology advances in modeling and simulation provide improved capability shape to meet the Department of Defense needs. Today we will examine a few of the modeling simulation tools available to the Department as examples of how this technology helps enhance military readiness. These range from the Navy's uh, readiness models used to determine resourcing requirements such as flying hours and maintenance activities to immersive training for ground combat, realistic flight simulation, and network missions operations. We'll, we will also look at how industry responds to the, part, the department needs for modeling simulation uh, capabilities as well as examine potential downsides to over-reliance upon simulated versus real-world training. And we're very fortunate to have the witness that, that we have today at, at this uh, hearing today. We have uh, Vice Admiral William Burke, United States Navy, Deputy Chief for Naval Operations, Fleet Readiness and Logistics, sir. Thank you so much. Major General Stephen R. Layfield, United States Army Director, Joint Training and Joint Warfighting Center, United States Joint Forces Command. And Major General Mark F. Gibson, United States Air Force Director of, Director of Operations, Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, Plans and Requirements, Headquarters, United States Air Force. And Rear Admiral Fred L. Lewis, United States Navy, uh, retired president, Naval Training and Simulation Association. And at this moment, the chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Forbes, my good friend, for any remarks that he would like to make. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I have a um, written statement that, with your permission, I'd like to put in the record, but I'd like to um, just make a few other comments. If no objections, I, I order. Um, I'm not sure, when we're up here, oftentimes we say this is one of the most important hearings that we will have in Congress, and I don't know that too many people would perhaps agree with us if we said that this morning, but I would say this, I think that the topic we're talking about is one of the most important topics that we can be talking about, given the current situation of where we are in the country. Mr. Chairman, I want to first thank you for co-chairing the Modeling and Simulation Caucus. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. I want to thank each of our witnesses because it will be up to us to be able to articulate to all of our colleagues and to Congress the importance of what you are able to give to us as a country. We know the incredible economic value of modeling and simulation that we look at, and we can see that any place we go across the country. We also know pretty much the training capacity. I just don't think we can get to the jointness capability that we need to be as a nation without modeling and simulation. You guys can help bring that to the forefront so that our colleagues understand that. Secondly, I don't think we can afford to do all the testing that we need to do today without modeling and simulation. That's just beyond our reach. Um, General, I think you're going to be able to tell us some of the things that we can utilize modeling and simulation for as far as keeping the readiness of our fleet and, the, the, and our aircraft and the stuff that we're going uh, to be utilizing there. But there's a third component that I hope at some point in time we can have a discussion on, if not today, down the road. Um, recently, I had a lady that met me in the hall, and she gave me an envelope. 
And she said, uh, Congressman, will you just read this envelope? I've been trying to get it in somewhere in government, and I can't, I can't get it there. And that night, I took the envelope, I opened it, and I read it. Her husband um, worked for an environmental company, and they had a piece of equipment that literally would take oil out of water. It wasn't a um, theory. It wasn't a prototype they were working on. It was functioning right then in West Virginia. All they needed to do was put it on barges. When I began to examine it, I found out that it was not only that letter, but thousands of ideas like that across the country that we just don't have a mechanism in government to handle those kinds of ideas and those kinds of thoughts. I think we know now, whether it is a hurricane situation like Katrina or an oil spill, one of the things that is very difficult for us as a government is when we're trying to make decisions. We oftentimes put a few smart men and women in a room and we're trying to filter out all of these ideas, concepts that are taking place with people in garages somewhere across the country, laboratories somewhere across the country. And we're not able to do that and process that very well. So Congressman Scott and I are working on a piece of legislation called the American Response Act that would really take the um, component that we're working on on interagency cooperation and where we can really create an opportunity for agencies to talk with each other, which they still can't do the way the military can do. But then overlay that with modeling and simulation so that we will be able to take those thousands of ideas that are coming in and process them uh, through a virtual world so that we can walk in and look 80 days down the road, 90 days down the road, and then come back on day two, day three, day four, and say, now we're going to make decisions based on the way the world will look 80, 90 days down the road. doesn't matter what administration or where it is. America needs that to be able to respond to the kind of crises we'll take in uh, the future. And you gentlemen um, have the key to that in what you're doing in modeling sim simulation. And, and the last thing I will tell you is this. There is always a fear when we have a hearing like this. There will be people who will say, well, I don't want them to think we're going to actually be able to do these things. Um, I remember years ago, one of the, my favorite places for my children to go was Disney World. And about 15 years ago, I remember coming out of one of their futuristic displays and looking, and they had people talking to each other and having their pictures on telephones. And I remember looking at that, and we were laughing and saying, I wonder if that'll ever happen. Today, when you look at some of those exhibits, they look historic because we're, we've surpassed that. I know um, in the early part of the 60s when we talked about putting men on the moon, uh, there were people who said, you know, that's never going to happen. We had people walk on the moon. You guys have an opportunity for us to create a world where as policymakers we can walk into the future, we can look around, we can decide if we like it or not, and then we can come back and have more informed decisions and we have not cost as much money, we haven't cost lives, and we have saved quantities of time. And for that, I just thank you for being here. We're looking forward to your testimony, and then hopefully the chairman and I on this committee can help uh, move this entire industry along to do what we think you can do uh, for our country. So thank you so much for being here. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing. You know, the world has changed a lot, and uh, we need to stay ahead of the curve. We need to do that. As the world moves, we need to move with it. And, and uh, there's a lot of changes. We see China, we see other countries moving ahead. And you probably saw on CNN what they saw. Uh, they thought it was a, you know, extraterrestrial, but they, they think it was a, a missile being fired. So I think this is, this is great what uh, we're doing now. So now let me, uh, Admiral Burke, please proceed with your testimony, followed by General Layfield, General Gibson, and Admiral Lewis. So whenever you're ready, Admiral, go right ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Chairman Ortiz, Representative Forbes, distinguished members of the House Armed Services Readiness Subcommittee, it's my honor to appear before you to testify on the Navy readiness models alongside uh, General Layfield, General Gibson, and Admiral Lewis. 
Today, our Navy remains engaged in supporting operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, and all other combatant commander areas of responsibility. We have over 120 ships deployed, which is more than 40 percent of our fleet, a global force for good on station around the world, deterring aggression, keeping sea lanes open for free trade, and when necessary, projecting power. Several dozen ships and subs are underway as part of preparations for deployment, and dozens more are in port training and conducting maintenance as they prepare for deployment. Others are in deep maintenance, resetting in stride. Our aviation, special warfare, and Naval Expeditionary Combat Command assets are going through a similar regimen. The combatant commander demand signal, as managed by the Global Force Management Board process, defines the capability needed to satisfy presence, presence and surge requirements worldwide. The fleet response plan describes the Navy process necessary to maintain, train, sustain, and deploy our forces in response to that demand. Our readiness models identify the resources necessary to deliver that capability. As a result, I have high confidence in the accuracy of the readiness and maintenance budget submission. A few years ago, we recognized the need to transition from a requirement based heavily on historic norms to a modeled requirement based on quantitative analysis of force generation and operations parameters. We have four interdependent readiness resourcing models that have been subjected to rigorous verification, validation, and accreditation supported by Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Our models are fully accredited and give us the ability to predict the cost of global operations in a dynamic operating environment. These results form the basis of the Navy's readiness budget submission throughout the programming, budgeting, and execution process. Navy ships and aircraft are capital-intensive forces that, when properly maintained, are designed to remain in service for decades. Scheduled maintenance of these ships and aircraft in the associated training and certification of our crews between deployments is a key element of the cost to own and operate the fleet. Our readiness models are designed to accurately reflect the cost to own, train, and operate our naval forces. The readiness models account for each phase of the fleet response plan and are integral to our readiness funding decisions. Readiness is a function of capable forces of sufficient capacity ready for tasking. The return on investment in our fleet readiness <coughs> program is measured by our ability to deliver required capabilities in rotational deployments while simultaneously responding to emergent needs of the COCOMs. Our models provide the fidelity necessary to accurately define required resources and predict readiness capacity based on varying financial resource levels. Thank you for your unwavering support and commitment to our sailors, Navy civilians, and their families, for all you do to make our Navy an effective and enduring global force for good. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. Major General Afield. Chairman Ortiz, Ranking Member Forbes, other members of the subcommittee, on behalf of General James Mattis, the commander of the United States Joint Forces Command, thank you for allowing me to appear before you today. The preparation and the readiness of the men and women of our nation's armed forces is our top priority. Since this task cannot be overstated, we want to thank this subcommittee and the United States Congress for all your continued support for our warfighters and their families. My opening remarks will be short, therefore I respectfully ask to submit a more detailed written statement to you for placement in the record and look forward to more detailed question and answers. No objection, it will be placed in the record. Thank you, sir. My testimony will address three areas. First, the key role that modeling and simulation plays as a training enabler. We use modeling and simulation to replicate the equipment that we have and the environment where our joint forces will operate. This replication is called the synthetic training environment or the synthetic battle space. We do this through a federation of models and simulations composed of joint and service systems and softwares. 
that is integrated and distributed by Joint Forces Command, the result, the, syn the synthetic battle space. A computer-generated model of forces, infrastructure, weapon systems, and physical terrain, when run together, will simulate the real world of challenging scenarios that our warfighters face every day. This synthetic environment supports exercises across all of our combatant commands and delivers specific mission rehearsal exercises in support of our forces in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Horn of Africa. Most of these exercises integrate coalition and interagency participation. This synthetic battle space also supports over 200 service-led exercises by replicating the joint environment inside their scenarios. Additionally, we're supported by the services we are we're supporting the services by assisting in the development of models and simulations for individual training applications which can be used at home stations and at home on the internet. The second area that I would like to highlight today is the direct and the indirect cost savings to be gained through the use of modeling and simulation. Modeling and simulation allows us to replicate selected training conducted virtually instead of live, thereby reducing overall costs, personnel tempo, uh, op tempo, and wear and tear on our expensive equipment. An example of this with the Navy can be seen when training the Joint and the Fleet Headquarters staffs within their fleet synthetic training program. This staff training, which has traditionally taken place during expensive full-scale at-sea exercises, can now be conducted effectively and efficiently peer-side at a significant cost savings. Another efficient use of modeling and simulation is when the training can be distributed and delivered to the training audience right at home. This saves travel costs, equipment, transportation costs, and affords members, service members, more at-home time with their families. We also use simulations to create complex operating environments which are cost prohibitive to replicate in a live training venue. My final point today has to do with the training of our close combat infantry and ground units, specifically the role of immersive training venues enabled by modeling and simulation. Throughout history, infantry and ground units have suffered the large majority of combat casualties. The same is true today in Iraq and Afghanistan. Research shows that these casualties often occur in the unit's initial firefights. Yet, we have not developed a realistic immersive simulation for ground units to prepare troops for their first engagements with the enemy. The time is now to bring state-of-the-art simulation to infantry and other ground units. To this end, working with the services, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and the Joint Staff, we have delivered a prototype infantry immersive training system to the Marine Corps and the United States Army to expose the realm of the possible for infantry immersive training, and it is yielding positive results. We have a demonstration of this system for you viewing in the atrium, outside in, in the anteroom. Additionally, the Deputy Secretary of Defense has budgeted $285 million in fiscal years 2011 to 2015 to the Services and United States Joint Forces Command to support the urgent development of infantry immersive training capabilities through the advancement of close combat infantry immersive training simulations. In summary, I would like to thank you, Chairman Ortiz, and the members of this committee for the opportunity to discuss United States Joint Forces Command's efforts in the area of modeling and simulation. And I would very much, again, especially like to thank you for your deep support and your sincere commitment to our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen and Marines, and our civilians in this fight. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. General Gibson. Chairman Ortiz and Taylor, ranking members Forbes and Bishop, and other distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to address the committee regarding your Air Force's modeling and simulation programs. Today's Air Force operates in a complex post-911 battle space that extended the scope of our mission beyond air and space into emerging operating environments such as cyberspace. The trend towards linking weapon systems across the domains of air, land, sea, and space creates a challenging need for effective individual 
and collective training for our warfighters. Modeling and simulation are powerful tools to expose our forces to the complexities and uncertainties of combat before ever stepping into harm's way. As we look to the future with our fifth generation weapon systems such as the F-22 and F-35, or in space, or in cyberspace operations, simulation will offer the best, and in many cases, the only opportunity to train. As we continue to operate in a resource-constrained environment, we realize we must strike a balance between the cost and capabilities of simulation and of live fly events. Yet it's clear that maintaining the readiness of today's Air Force requires the flexible, adaptive, and repetitive training capabilities that simulation offers. We increasingly turn to modeling and simulation to meet the challenge of both efficient and cost-effective training. Our goal is to produce the most effective and proficient warfighters in its shortest amount of time. Your Air Force has a long history of using simulation, beginning all the way back with the Link Trainer in World War II. Now we utilize simulation systems to conduct operations analysis, weapon system testing and evaluation, camp command and control at the tactical, operation, and even strategic levels of command. We are working to build simulation capabilities that can operate across networks to integrate training and all of our core warfighting capabilities with those of our sister services and of our coalition and allied friends. Today we use simulation to improve training in every type of mission. For over a decade, we've championed the use of live virtual constructive training technologies to conduct distributed mission operations that connect geographically separated units into a common operating environment. Let me take a moment to discuss what we mean by live virtual and constructive, or LVC. Live training is what we're all familiar with, actual airmen operating their equipment and aircraft in a real environment. Virtual training are those same airmen operating in a simulated aircraft in the virtual environment. A basic flight simulator connected to a virtual environment would be one example. Constructive training adds computer-generated inputs to the virtual environment, such as a generated threat that would make you react. Today's high-fidelity simulators offer tremendous possibilities to present high-threat environments and to rehearse specific mission events or even entire missions. However, these high-fidelity systems require significant investment to be those effective training tools. And it must be kept in mind that simulation is not really meant to replace live training, but to complement it. And in most cases, to make our live training even more effective. But in many scenarios, simulation is the only way we can adequately train our airmen. For example, space and cyberspace training events rely almost solely on simulation. Furthermore, we've been using theater and operational level of command control simulations to train with our sister service components and joint warfighters for decades now. And now simulation has become a key component for training our fifth generation pilots in the F-22 and the F-35. In conclusion, Air Force and its combat ready airmen remain focused on the mission, supporting ongoing operations and ensuring the continued security of our great nation. Model modeling and simulation is and will continue to be critical to building and training a proficient and adaptive force. I thank the committee for its shared commitment to our national defense and for this opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you, sir. Admiral Lewis. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it's a pleasure for me to appear before you today to discuss one of America's most exciting and promising enterprises, the modeling and simulation and training industry. Uh, I have been the president of the National Training and Simulation Association now for 15 years. And NTSA is this country's premier organization dedicated to furthering the growth and health of this critical national asset. Let me start by saying that simulation technologies are revolutionizing how we learn in areas such as disaster response, emergency medicine, cultural interaction, military and law enforcement, advanced surgical procedures, and predictions about complex weather systems Modeling and simulation are enabling us to prepare more quickly, more effectively, and with far greater flexibility than ever before. Gone are the days when we learn from texts and then plunged headlong into the complexities of dangerous and high-risk real-world situations. Now we train in virtual environments that uncannily replica replicate those we will face in combat, in terrorist attacks, and in the emergency operating room. 
In the last few years, we have begun a journey into virtual worlds that don't just promise to blur the distinction between simulation and reality, they will soon actually remove it. The National Training and Simulation Association promotes the growth and use of modeling simulation technologies through a wide variety of activities, including scholarships, certification programs, sponsorship of extensive research, and annual events such as the recently concluded Congressional Modeling and Simulation Expo held in the Rayburn Office Building with a close collaboration of the Congressional Modeling and Simulation Caucus, with which we enjoy an active and productive relationship. Our flagship activity is, of course, the annual Inter-Service Training Simulation Education Conference, ITSEC, held annually in the uh, late fall in Orlando, Florida. This event, which, like the industry as a whole, is enjoying healthy growth despite an uncertain overall economy, and now attracts well over 500 corporations, government and research organizations from around the United States and from over 60 countries around the globe. Over 100 research and scientific papers are presented and discussed, making ITSIC not only the world's largest exhibition of modeling and simulation technology, but also the world's most important annual focal point for advancement of these technologies. With over half a million square feet of exhibit space showcasing the amazing panoply of modeling and simulation, ITSIC is truly a phenomenal sight. And as an American, I take great pride in seeing this evidence of how vibrant and creative this sector of our economy is and what great promise it holds for the future. During my time at NTSA, I've seen the modeling and simulation industry not only grow exponentially, but undergo rapid and in some cases unexpected change. The explosion in computer processing power, which began in the last decade and which is continuing unabated, has enabled simulation training to migrate from platform trainers where single individuals interact with single training devices, the so-called man-machine interface, into a wide variety of immersive virtual environments, including those which link multiple actors into a unified training matrix. It's becoming clear that in the not too distant future, we will train with avatars, wholly immersed in a three-dimensional alternative world. Creating such environments is, in fact, the next great technological challenge for our industry, but we are on the way to getting there. With it, among other precedent-setting applications, we will be able to immerse our warfighters in new and unfamiliar cultures, allowing them to learn by doing, by living in a, in a, a, a virtual Afghan village, for example. I don't believe this level of technology will be achieved while we pursue our current objectives in Iraq and Afghanistan, but we'll see it in the not too far future, and it'll play an, an invaluable role in many critical areas of national importance. As to today's modeling and simulation industry, I'd like to underscore not only that it is important to a wide variety of different domains, but also the flexibility and agility of our industry to respond to changing requirements based on changes in the threat environment. A good example of that responsiveness was the development in Orlando, the deployment and deployment to Iraq in six months of a convoy tactics trainer. Our industry had quickly and effectively answered a critical battlefield requirement to train our soldiers and Marines how to react if attacked while en route in a convoy of trucks and uh, or other vehicles. My confidence in the modeling and simulation industry's technological capabilities is unshakable and based on the solid evidence of creativity and innovation that I've attempted to briefly outline today. Against this promising background, however, we face two challenges that each, in very different ways, threaten to hinder what otherwise would be further dramatic progress. The first is a bureaucratic obstacle that can be removed, I'm convinced, with concentrated action by all interested parties, specifically the Economic Classification Policy Committee of the Office of Management and Budget has rejected for the third time in eight years our applications for granting unique industrial classification codes for modeling and simulation. As we have stated in our request, granting such stature would not only bestow deserved formal status and recognition of our industry, but would also greatly facilitate tracking of economic data pertaining to modeling and simulation. 
which at present is an elusive goal. While we have some economic data for certain geographic areas where the simulation industry enjoys a pervasive presence, for example, in Orlando, Florida, or in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia, we have no unified picture of the industry's overall contribution to the health of the American economy, although we know intuitively that it is considerable and growing rapidly. We intend to vigorously challenge this ruling and call on those with an interest in furthering the growth of the modeling and simulation community of practice to join us in that uh, activity. The second challenge facing our industry is of a more fundamental nature. For a, a number of years, alarm bells have been alerting us to the widening gap between the United States and most other developed countries in the science and technology skills of our young citizens. Studies equating our achievement levels to those of some less developed countries and indicating that we have made no improvements in our standings uh, in the, around the globe since 1990 have begun to focus public and private organizations upon the urgent need to rekindle student interest in the hard sciences and to strengthen technology teaching in the classroom. But raising awareness of the seriousness of our shortcomings may prove the easier task. Ahead of us lies the challenge of creating a sense of excitement and enthusiasm among our youth about the promise that technology and its opportunities offer for a lifetime of achievement and personal reward. Just as demanding is the need to provide enhanced instruction and a clear viable path for classrooms to careers. President Kennedy's challenge to reach the moon by the end of the 1960s motivated several generations of Americans to great achievement in science and engineering. What we now need in the 21st century is a similar challenge. And I believe that modeling and simulation can be a key to that excitement. Perhaps no other industry is more dependent on a reliable supply of first-class scientists and engineers than the modeling and simulation community. At the same time, modeling and simulation enjoys a built-in advantage in that young people have surrounded themselves with variations of simulation technology. Video games in particular are a type of virtual simulation, and in fact, serious games based on video game technology are an increasingly important component of the overall simulation training picture. But even with that kind of stimulation of the younger generation, our downward trend continues. We at NTSA have engaged in several efforts to try to reverse the trend. And while worthwhile and successful, they are only fractional and affect only the margins. We must do more to enhance science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education, STEM education across the nation. If we do not, then we will continue to see our American leadership in technology erode as other nations eagerly assume the leadership position previously held by us. There are challenges ahead for my community, but in the exciting and dynamic world of modeling and simulation, the way ahead is lit with the promise of being able to address our nation's most vexing problems. Sir, I thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. We, we have had some very good testimony this morning, and I'm going to ask the, uh, all the panel here a question, and maybe each one of you can can try to answer the best that you can. Uh, in your opinion, what is the proper balance between the use of simulated training and real world or live training? A and what criteria are used to evaluate to achieve that balance? And of course, if I understand correctly, the equipment that I, that I saw back here uh, is being, it's not being used now, it's a prototype. Uh, I mean, once you do that, if you can give me a description, do you get used to either one of the live training or the simulated training? Maybe you can help me understand some of this. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll take the first stab at that question. The, without question, a, a balance of all uh, the venues of training, live or simulated, is a key component of the, of the total force readiness. Um, all of our services uh, apply great rigor 
uh, to finding that balance and making sure that we have uh, the most effective mix uh, of combination of training uh, venues. Outside, uh, you're, you're watching what is a modeling simulation uh, venue. It, it is not intended to replace live at all. It is intended to enhance uh, live training and to enhance the readiness of that small unit that's experience that, experiencing that venue. Anybody else would like to give it a try? Uh, Congressman uh, Ortiz, uh, I think in each scenario, there are several variables that one would have to consider, in, in, given my experience in, in aviation, especially in the air uh, side. Um, one is the type of mission that you're trying to uh, replicate, um, and then offsetting that with the ability both of the simulation and, and the investment, and whether you can achieve a high fidelity simulator. Uh, that will do a good job of replicating that live, live flying activity or command and control activity or whatever it is you're trying to pursue. Um, where we've seen that sometimes uh, begin to drift is requiring uh, that simulator or simulation to continue to keep a pace of the aircraft upgrades and things of that nature. And as soon as those two begin to break apart, uh, you encounter what we call negative training. In other words, the pilots and the operators know what it's like in the actual aircraft, and if they go to something that doesn't accurately replicate that, uh, it becomes problematic. So there is an investment aspect of this and a technology aspect of keeping those two joined very closely. In the end, I think uh, each system uh, has its own balance uh, based on that and the scenario and what you're trying to do. I think simulation is, is fantastic in its ability to uh, stop and start again from an instructional value. Uh, you don't have to waste an entire sortie or mission to come back and talk about what happened. You have the ability to, to interrupt and instruct and correct right then and there while it's, uh, while it's effective. But in the end, uh, certainly some of the live, uh, live flying or live activity has to take place because ultimately that's where the confidence is built in that system before you uh, have to employ it for real. Mr. Chairman, um, I think I, I would agree with what's been set up until this point. I think there's, when you, when you think about simulation, there's essentially three things that, that occur. You can either, you can fully simulate some of the things that you're required to do, and you can get full credit, if you will, for that simulation. There's other things that you can simulate that you may want to do in the actual platform. So, but you can get to a level of proficiency faster by doing the simulator and more cheaply. And then there's, there are certain things that, that the simulators just don't lend themselves to yet at this point. And those are some of the more complex evolutions. You know, we haven't figured out how to fully simulate a ship yet or uh, multiple aircraft flying together. Those, you know, flying close to one another, that's got a a pucker factor in the real world that you may not get in the simulator. We also need to recognize that the simulators are growing in capability every year. So what was, what we weren't able to do last year, we might be able to do this year. So as, as we improve the fidelity of those simulators, we can do more in them. Uh, and then the last thing I'd, I'd like to say is, to follow on what Mark said is the, uh, it is critical that we, that we upgrade this, the simulators. Uh, now I'm a, I'm a submariner and the way, we, the way we've done this in, in my career is we bought the simulator up front and we made a commitment to upgrade the software when we upgraded the ship. So th what that allowed us to do was continue to train on that simulator and not get that negative training that, that uh, the general mentioned. However, that is a challenge because we're taking away money from something else to, to upgrade those. Mr. Chairman, just let me add uh, one uh, 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 final uh, comment or thought to uh, what you've heard from the, uh, my distinguished colleagues here, and that is that um, uh, the, the mix and the balance depends on the scenario, depends on the piece of equipment that you're, that you're trying to train an indiv individual on. 
the classic example, uh, is, of course, is the Apollo program and the, for, the, uh, for the air crew or the astronauts who operated a lunar module. They, they only had an opportunity to train in a simulator before they actually did the, the, the real, uh, real evolution. Uh, so that's kind of one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum is uh, the more routine kinds of uh, scenarios, situations, operations that you might have to engage in when you're operating a piece of equipment, an airplane, a ship, or submarine. Uh, you can easily uh, train people on, on simulators in, in, uh, in that regard. So the Gordian's knot of, of training and simulation is the question that you just asked, and that is what's the balance? It depends on the equipment. It depends on the the risk involved in operating that piece of equipment and the kind of environment in which you're going to operate, and also depends on the requirements that each individual service, service and the joint community has to, for, uh, for operation of that equipment and those units who are employing those, those equipments. I'm just going to ask one short question before I pass it to my good friend, Mr. Ford. The candidates, the crew that uh, utilize the uh, simulators, uh, do you have some of them who might have a problem adapting or learning, and do they fail, or most of the people that use it, uh, most of the crew members or the soldiers or sailors or Marines that use it, do they all pass with flying colors, or do you have problems with them? May I, uh, Mr. Chairman, can I give you a, a non-military example of, of uh, in response to your question? And that is the... Um, uh, you know, simulation is used not only in the military case, but also there are hundreds of applications for utilizing simulators in the private sector, one of which is in the health healthcare field. Uh, so um, uh, one classic simulation and, and, and uh, uh, scenario and equipment that, that are, is being used in medical schools around the country and hospitals around the country are the, the operating room environment, which can be simulated with a simulated patient. Uh, so um, the, the operating team can come in, do the procedure, the, the, uh, the mannequin is hooked up to life cycle, life science monitoring equipment and so forth, uh, and they can uh, you know, apply the, the, the medications that are required for a specific case. And uh, if they're successful, the, the mannequin survives. And if they're unsuccessful, then the mannequin dies. But better on the mannequin than on you or me, I say. And, uh, but the beauty of it all is that um, uh, they can step back away from that, and the whole scenario can be replayed with the participants observing what had transpired during the execution of the procedures that they had just uh, used to try to assist that patient. So um, it, it's... Uh, uh, not necessarily do they, uh, once they go through the procedure, do they get an, uh, um, an up check. Um, they can fall, if they fail, they can fall back and, and relearn. And so that's the beauty of the, the, the simulated environment. The reason is I ask is because in war you die one time. In politics, you die many times. <laughs> Mr. Forbes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you gentlemen for your expertise and being here today. And I'll try to ask each one of you uh, a, a question and then uh, pass it on to my colleagues and maybe come back if we have additional time. But Admiral Burke, if I could start with you just because of where you are on the podium there. We, we know that some recent studies have at least placed into question some of the Navy's readiness modeling. and I, uh, financial mind don't, don't want to address that now but my question for you is this how do you uh, feel the current financial models used by the Department of Defense compared to corporate America um, specifically do you believe they rival the corporate models in sophistication and accuracy or do you believe that there may be room to improve upon these models and I know all of you are being brief in your testimony but I read your written testimony, and one of the statements that you mentioned in there it says all models meet an industry standard of less than 5% error acceptance level. What industry are we comparing that to for that? Thanks for the question, sir. The, uh, I, th I think, first of all, we go through a, 
a rigorous verification, validation, and accreditation process. And that w we get, uh, we have a team within the, within the Navy staff that uh, works in the model area and, and does this. But also we get help from outside folks, John Hopkins, APL. And John Hopkins is in the business of, of or they have a team that's in the bu business of doing this across industry. And so the standard is essentially that your assumptions are well documented, the model re results are stable, and there's a correlation between the input and the output. And the, uh, the standard is five, less than 5%. Um, now, as far as what DOD is doing to, to do their modeling, I'm not specifically sure. Address the Navy then, if you'd like. Yes, sir. But in the case of the Navy, uh, essentially what we're doing is taking a complex set of inputs and putting that input into databases and spreadsheets to relate that to a, to a cost output. So if you, if you want to say, if, if you want to take the fleet readiness program and say, here's what we need, then we can easily relate that to cost. Am I getting near what you're looking for? Am I you, missing you, your You point? are. Let me try one more stab at it because, one, I appreciate what you're doing, and we truly are trying to hear, we are here trying to help. Um, jointly and cooperatively getting to the goal that we want. One of the things in this subcommittee and in our full committee that I know the chairman's constantly grappling with is we have proposals that come to us where we are given option A, um, but it's very difficult for us to say if we pick option A, that means we take B, C, and D off the board. And we're constantly trying to get our arms around that so that we can ask those questions so we are intelligently making decisions that uh, help the defense of the country. And sometimes we can get all the accreditations in the world, all the checkoffs in the world, but if they're not answering the questions or they're not reaching the goals and we're still off, um, it hasn't done us much good. So my question, not critical at all, it, it's simply groping for forgetting the accreditations and the checkoffs that we all do so that we kind of protect ourselves and saying we've done everything we needed to do. In your experience, when you compare what we are doing with the Navy or the Department of Defense, how did they stack up in comparison to the models that the private sector is using? Are they reaching as good a results? Are they as predictive? Um, and, and secondly, when we say they've got to be within 5% of the industry, what industry are we basing that on? Yes, sir, let me take the last part first. The 5% the is, is we look at what the model predicted versus what actually occurred. So we go back and look at that. So that's, that's how you get to the 5%. It's not a, the 5% is the industry standard for full accreditation of the model. We okay. just happen, so both of those gotcha. come together. Okay. Now what we used to do is we used to say, what did we do last year? Or so that's probably good enough for this year. Uh, I don't know that there is a, uh, I don't know that we, there is an industry that would compare to what we do. And I don't know that we've tried to do that, but I'll, I'll go back and look at that and figure out how we would compare ourselves to industry, sir. And then, Admiral, any suggestions you have about what we can do to help you uh, do that, we would really appreciate as a committee because we want to do that. Yes, sir. General Layfield, um, Chairman asked a very good question about balance between live and virtual training, but General Mattis um, has been a leader in this area. It is a crucial uh, speech I heard him give about the amount of lives that we can save for people in the infantry. Because as I recall his speech, which I heard him deliver, 
he mentioned the fact that the infantry was taking the blunt of the casualties and that if he could narrow that learning curve down months, that he could save a number of lives, and he felt that modeling and simulation was the key to narrowing that down. If I've misstated that in any way, please correct me, but if that's close to accurate, would you tell us and explain the, the essence of what he was saying and how we might be able to do more with modeling and simulation to save those lives in the field? Congressman, uh, that, that's very clear, and I agree with you uh, completely with General Mattis's comments and the intent of the message he was trying to portray, which is a, one of our keen focuses at Joint Forces Command is to, is to try and build uh, an exercise regime, a scenario, an immersive um, venue for all of our warfighters so, so that their very first fight is really no worse than their last practice, their last rehearsal. Using modeling and simulations is a great way to enable that. Out here uh, in the anteroom, we have a demonstration of the exact same thing. Uh, on that video, and this is a quote, I'd like to, to read it to you, uh, to bring home the point of how valuable bringing home an immersive environment to the, to the uh, ground unit, specifically our great Marines right now, and our great Army, and all of our ground forces, to help them actually get through that first firefight and make it really be no worse than their last practice. And this is a quote from uh, Sergeant Jose McFadden from the 29th Infantry out of Virginia, and uh, recently back from theater, and he said when he tried on this equipment, I got caught up in the heat of the moment a lot of the time, referring to his experience in the machine there. It certainly felt like I was back in theater. Now that's what we're after. We're after an immersion simulation capability that allows our, our, uh, our, our great military to experience combat and all the stresses of that before they have to actually do it. So thank you, Congressman. And, and General, it, again, if I'm um, understanding General Mattis, we have a disproportionate number of casualties that take place in that initial um, deployment situation when that training is not um, where we'd like for it to be, let's say. By reducing that down, uh, General Mattis believes that we can save a number of lives and, and a number of casualties and feels that modeling simulation and the immersion training that you're talking about could be a major assistance in doing that. Is that a fair statement? Yes, Congressman, that is fair. Good. Uh, General Gibson, um, one of the things that um, uh, we know that um, you mentioned is that uh, we can get there faster and cheaper with modeling and simulation. But one of the other things uh, that, that I was really um, looking for is uh, how are we using modeling and simulation for structural models? I mean, I know we had a, a concern with our F-15s not too long ago, the cracks on the Longevins. When we first built those planes, we didn't have modeling simulation like we have today. Do we have adequate structural models for like the F-22, the F-35? And secondly, how can we use modeling and simulation to go back on some of our legacy systems and really extrapolate and look and predict models that are problems that could be causing uh, caused by the op tempo that we have put some of those units through? Uh, yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say that modeling and simulation is my core competency, but by uh, serendipity, I was uh, at the Fort Worth plant for the F-35 last week on a visit, uh, the simulator, and I know that they use modeling of their structures extensively there uh, to make predictions. Obviously, that aircraft is built for all the services and, and will be exposed to a number of environments, and, uh, and they walk me through that process, and in fact, uh, that that is being borne out in, in many of their follow-on flight uh, evals. Um, as far as going back uh, to previous aircraft, I'm not familiar with uh, a, a lot of that. I know that there, are, there is great interest because we have flown a number of our, uh, what we would call uh, major combat operations, MCO aircraft in, in this counterinsurgency fight and used up a lot of flying hours and a lot of flying time. And we're still uh, somewhat uncertain on what that is, what toll that is taking on those airframes. Um, 
I saw some analysis the other day about the, on the A10s, as, as specifically how much uh, did we think we were consuming them essentially over the predicted rate that we had before. So I can take that for the record, uh, Congressman. I don't have the specifics with me, but I know there is a concern to go If you would, that. would just please get us back that information because yes, we want to help you with that. That could be a huge benefit for us to do. Yes, Last sir. thing, uh, General Lewis, uh, take us into Tomorrowland. Uh, what can modeling and simulation do for us? Um, because you are you, where the rubber meets the road on both the policy aspect and also what's out there. But, but show us tomorrow, if we're smart enough to be able to use modeling and simulation, how can it help us in dealing with emergency situations? How can it take these ideas people have across America? And then also, uh, what kind of magnet is modeling and simulation to encourage people to go into math and science, which is one of the big concerns that you mentioned? Thank you, Congressman. Um, the, um, I alluded to a, a, a bit of what the future might look like in my, in my uh, testimony, earlier testimony, but to amplify just a little bit, um, uh, Congressman Ortiz mentioned the fact about the uh, the uh, pictures. Or I'm sorry, that was you, sir. Talked about the, uh, the the phones with the photographs and the pictures and so forth. It wasn't too long ago when there was a television series called Star Trek, starred Leonard Nimoy, Doctor Spock, and and that whole crew. And if you'll recall, um, when they were on a, an, another world, they would reach into their pockets and they flip out a little device and click it open and. They, that was their communicator to talk to the Starship Enterprise. Well, that was really quite something back then to imagine a world wherein you could be able to talk to somebody that quickly and that easily. And then what do we have today? Probably each one of us in our pockets, our Blackberry or our cell phones or, or whatever. Another piece of uh, Star Trek of the time, and this is again something I alluded to in my remarks, um, another piece of, 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 of that particular uh, that show, then those people who who wrote that script were true visionaries, absolutely incredible. But um, uh, a part of the Starship Enterprise, one, one space, one compartment on that ship was called the holodeck. And the holodeck was a space that was empty to someone who just happened to walk by it. But once you entered it and the doors closed, and you would say, computer, take me to whatever place in the world or whatever planet or whatever time that you wanted to be inserted, and suddenly that whole environment would appear. Now, just imagine what you have out here in the Andy room, or we've seen demonstrated elsewhere, wherein you see a different world through glasses, through goggles, through something you put over your eyes. And this, this imaginary world is portrayed for you, and, and you operate in that environment. It's immersive kind of training that we're talking about, and we're about ready to really march forward with that in the, in the m and uh, industry. It's not too much of a stretch to think that if you have that world here right now, just in goggles and glasses before your eyes, to take it out a few feet ahead of you, around you, to surround you in that, in that uh, virtual environment. Um, not too stretch of the imagination to think that that could happen. And I would say, say that I've heard, I've heard estimates that we would have that kind of a capability, not soon, but in certainly the next 25 or 30, 35 years, we would have the ability to totally immerse an individual in a virtual environment, in a virtual world, surrounded by avatars, and operating in a place where it, wherever you might think you would like to be, in whatever kind of condition or threat environment uh, that's, there, that's there for you. In terms of um, communicating that kind of a message, that excitement, and, and I hope a little bit of my excitement about this technology has come through in my, in my remarks because I am very excited about the opportunities that are ahead for us. But uh, I, I personally want to try to communicate that excitement to the young people uh, in our country, to the youngsters, the children in grade school and middle school and high school, to excite, excite them about the opportunities uh, uh, ahead if they would become interested in math and science and engineering and pursue careers in, in those fields. We see that happen to some extent at the big event that we have at the end of each year down at ITSEC, where we invite students from uh, all over the Central Florida region. We invite teachers from all over the country 
to come to, to visit us, to science teachers, math teachers to visit us, to, to see the kinds of technology that we have displayed on, on the floor and um, the, the kinds of uh, uh, bells and whistles that they're, they're able to experience firsthand. The interesting thing about the technology that we operate in on, on a day-to-day um, -day basis is that it changes, it's dynamic, it improves, it gets better every single day, every single year. Uh, as I reflect on my time at, uh, at ITSEC and in this community, I've seen it change from almost a 90 to 100% focus on very high-end simulators for aircraft and training air crew and so forth. But over time, over the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen that change based on the threat, the threat, the environment in which our forces, our troops are operating and, and where we are around the globe. That, it changes, it evolves, it, it shifts in a particular direction. We're in the direction now of, uh, we trend, we've uh, gone from this, the convoy tactics trainer that I talked about to the Humvee upset trainer that was, has been developed for our troops. And now we're moving into the immersive uh, piece. And the technology's maturing. It's getting better. And we'll be able to answer the kinds of challenge that um, uh, senior leaders like General Mattis have set uh, out for, for our industry. They, they, the people are there. The creativity's there. Um, and the, the motivation is there to, uh, to address those kinds of problems. Admiral, thank you. Thank all of you. And, and Mr. Chairman, just as I yield back the balance of my time, we will go there. The question is whether we get there first or we get there second. Sure. And, and just to lay out the importance of what you all are doing, one of the experts that I know that speaks on modeling simulation around the world, whenever he goes to any country, including the United States, he will have an average of about 200, 250 people that show up to listen to him talk. When he went to China to speak, he had 5,000 engineers that showed up to listen to him, and he said they were asking cutting-edge questions, working on cutting-edge technologies. We cannot afford to be second. We've got to be first. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for leading uh, the charge on this, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you so much. We have several uh, members here, and we, we will try to stick to the five-minute rule so that uh, everybody, and if necessary, will have a second round. Mr. Henrich. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for, for joining us today. Um, I am um, lucky enough to have the Air Force's Distributed Mission Operations Center in my district, which um, I didn't know a great deal about uh, before I was elected to Congress. I, I actually used to work on Kirtland Air Force Base. I'm a mechanical engineer by training, but I was pretty amazed when I saw what they're, they're doing out there. And it it's, speaks to some of uh, what you were talking about, about pulling people together to work in a virtual environment at the, at the same time. And I pulled up a little article on, um, on their virtual flag exercises where um, one of which included 617 warfighters in, in work, working together in a virtual battle space at the same time across uh, a couple dozen weapon systems, 61 different distributed units. And, and I think that, that that is one of the things as we move forward that, that we need to understand and, and plan for is how do we make sure that um, that the various different simulation platforms uh, don't work just in isolation of themselves, but work together so that we can have these more complex simulations as we move forward where numerous different people, you know, one people on the ground to somebody flying an HH-60 to somebody in a, a, a tanker to a CV-22, all can sort of participate in a, a battle space exercise together. Um, how are we planning to make sure that as we move forward, we, we plan ahead of time to make sure that those pieces can talk to each other and, and work together in a, in a sim simulated battle space? Sir, I'll take that one uh, uh, quickly. Uh, you're right, the virtual flag exercise uh, intended to complement the former fairly famous red flag exercise, green flags, and others that were live fly events for, for training. Now we try to accomplish most of those training events in a virtual environment, uh, and it helps us 
not only in those systems, but to be achieve what we call cross-domain integration. Now we bring space and cyber and the other domains in and learn uh, a little bit more about those relationships. To your question specifically, uh, we continue to be challenged on making sure that everybody can quote unquote plug into the network. Uh, there's two really kind of three dimensions of that. One is that system uh, has to be able to come onto the network. Um, that system, as you acquire that, very rapidly then becomes uh, dated with where the, the DMO uh, network uh, software and connectivity moves ahead. Uh, we're already, I, I again mentioned, I talked, uh, was at Fort Worth last week, I talked to them yesterday about the F-35 simulator and its ability because we had some challenges with the F-22 and its ability to plug into the DMOC or the DTOC that the, uh, the reserve component runs. The second piece of that, though, besides uh, U.S. with U.S., as you begin to plug in this network and, and is even more critical these days as we use most of our fifth-generation capability to train there, is, um, frankly, security and how you have multiple levels of security uh, and be able to operate in that environment that you're, you know, everybody on the network can see what everybody else has and how you train in that coalition environment. Uh, so that's kind of the, that's the last plug that you want to be able to operate in a joint environment with our sister services. Obviously, that's the way we're going to fight. But also then as we bring in other members in the F-35, as you know, is an international system. So how we're going to be able to do that in a multi-level security and make sure that, that we're able to protect uh, those, those uh, capabilities that we have. So it's, it's the timeliness of what you buy that day and uh, quickly begins to expire. And then also as you move out into the out years and capabilities are added, how those are brought on board in a multi-level security uh, concern. But we are aware of them, Congressman, and we're, uh, we try to work those very hard. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll yield back. Mr. Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank all of you for being here. This is a critically important uh, subject. You know, I remember a quote that said something along the lines that in times of crisis, we do not often rise to meet the occasion. We default to our level of preparation. And uh, it seems like this is especially apropos to the, the, uh, the whole subject today. And I really appreciate all of you because if you do a good job, of course, it makes our soldiers not only the most lethal, but the... the the most protected and safe on the battlefield. And it's, it's always wonderful when you can have challenges or problems in, in the laboratory, as it were, or in, in, in uh, um, the, the, the environment where no one's getting hurt than it is to actually have to learn those lessons on the battlefield. So I, I know that all of you know that this committee wants, as much as anything, to try to make sure that when our soldiers do have to go into theater, that as many of them come home as safely as possible. And with that in mind, I, I want to take uh, a question up that uh, uh, our ranking member Forbes uh, uh, put forth, and that was having to do with our infantry. Uh, I know General Layfield, that's a, always the, the most difficult situation when you have new infantry going into the field and don't have some of the battlefield awareness that some of the older heads might have there, that that's always an especially challenging environment. So I guess my first question to you is how far off are we from having a state-of-the-art uh, immersive infantry ground simulation system, and, and, and is the $285 million over the fiscal years 2011 to 2015, uh, is that enough to field such a system? Let me uh, take your first question first, Congressman. Uh, I, I, can, I agree with you that completely, like was stated earlier, that we have to do all we can. Uh, the time is now to take uh, an immersive venue uh, to the ground fight. We are partnered heavily with our services, particularly very heavily with the United States Marine Corps, those great Marine fighters, and our United States Army ground soldiers out there, and all elements that are on the ground to do just that, to make sure that they can survive and be successful in that very first firefight and not have to learn it on the fly. That is precisely what it's all about, sir, so we, I agree with you completely on that analogy. The uh, the requirements uh, associated with that and how fast we can achieve that end are constantly under review. Uh, as we dialogue with the services and, and work with them and support their efforts in this, in this venue, um, we definitely uh, assess our requirements and we sum submit them to the Office of the Secretary of Defense and those requirements are being met. We have uh, adequate resources to pursue this 
but I have to caveat that technology is advancing rapidly, and we have to stay uh, uh, with the technology advances, if not ahead of it. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, I read just recently where China now uh, has surpassed the United States in the use of energy. Uh, you know, oftentimes there's a, a debate in this country as to, you know, this country uses too much energy per capita, but uh, they forget that we produce more uh, per capita per the amount of energy we use than just about anyone in the world. But it does, it does seem to me a telling situation that the nation of China is now using more energy than we are, and that seems to translate into some of the discussion that we're talk, having to, today that, uh, that China is going to rapidly advance in these areas. So, uh, Vice Admiral Burke, my, my next question is for you. In light of the uh, accreditation of the air, of, uh, air crew uh, model of, of 2008 and in the, and in the ship operations uh, one in 2009, have you, have you noticed, you know, one of the things that would help us so much in this community, I wish there were more people here, but if we had hard um, evidence, hard research showing that when these young soldiers have gone through systems, um, uh, simulation systems, that they come home in higher numbers, that they do better on the battlefield, uh, do you have any, any uh, uh, data that would show some appreciable improvement in readiness and effectiveness in those two areas and in the, the uh, uh, lower casualty rates? Sir, in the readiness models, essentially what we're doing is uh, taking readiness requirements and translating that to cost. Uh, it sounds simple, it's pretty complex, but what, we, what we've been able to do with that is you can see where there may be growth in certain areas, and we've been able to get into those areas and look at them as far as uh, why, why is there growth and maybe tamp that down if possible. Um, as far as our simulation efforts, um, I can't really say that, that we have uh, f figured out that we've saved people's lives uh, in the ships and, and aircraft, although I have to believe that, that the pilots that fly the aircrafts or fly, fly the aircraft and the, and the ship operators are far better than they, they would be without them. Uh, Fortunately, we have not had a lot of attacks against our aircraft or against our ships to, to know whether that is true. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield back, uh, but I, I hope that we can move forward, especially in this, this whole immersive uh, infantry simulation, because it, it seems to me like that we could perhaps even gain some, some data that we could show the rest of the world that it would be compelling. Thank you all very much. Mr. Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral Lewis, when you were commenting about Star Trek and describing, you know, the future that was predicted back then and exists now, I found myself thinking the one thing I really want to be able to say from time to time is beam me up, Scotty. Uh, and so uh, if you can just sort of hurry things along so that people like me are in a position to say beam me up, Scotty, and actually get out of the circumstances that we're in real quickly, I'd appreciate it. I wholeheartedly agree with uh, uh, what the chairman has said, Mr. Forbes has said, research and development has been a critically important part of the edge that the United States has had militarily for decades. It is why, frankly, uh, we're on top of the world. Nobody can come close to touching us right now. And this modeling and simulation is just part of that. Uh, I just finished an, a lengthy essay on health care which I published last week in the National Review Online, uh, challenge that we're all facing with regard to programs like this is funding across DOD, across the government, across the country. And we're running up an awful lot of red ink. In this article, I suggest that the principal problem with funding with red ink, where healthcare is concerned, is our third party payer system. And over the last year, I've had lots of discussions with my colleagues. I'm just not able to sort of break through with my colleagues about the importance of looking at the impact cost-wise of comprehensive health insurance and that model uh, nationally uh, and what would be a better model, a different model. And in the article, frankly, one of the things that I say, I use a couple of analogies. The best one that I can think of is splitting the tab for dinner, and I hypothesize the entire country 
every night going out and splitting the tap for dinner. And then I hypothesize, I just sort of wonder, well, what happens to the national economy and to individual wealth over time as a result of that? But I specifically call for modeling. I mean, modeling is the way you wind up getting to the bottom line where, uh, well, at least narrowing the range of differences of opinion concerning how much waste costs uh, superfluous expenditures there are in the healthcare system. And if we don't do that, uh, we're going to be really challenged to fund appropriate research development modeling simulation. Uh, it, it, interesting, I walked in here, I'm sorry I'm late, I was doing a missile defense uh, uh, talk uh, and, uh, and came in and, and, and heard the last little bit about medical modeling. I've made a request uh, for funding for uh, medical simulation, trauma simulation, a, a teaming up of the Georgia National Guard and the Medical Center of Central Georgia, one of the very few tier, tier one trauma hospitals uh, in Georgia, uh, to, uh, to use simulation as a, as a mechanism for training troops, not just National Guard troops, hopefully this center will wind up offering training that goes beyond the National Guard, training that will then help these folks uh, where uh, uh, actually dealing with uh, trauma events, whether they're overseas or here in the United States, multiple uh, casualties, uh, and how do you handle that? And that takes money. It's a three and a half million dollar request. Well, you know, multiply that over all the different things that you're doing, and I guess I, I find myself wondering whether or not it is your impressions, and I guess you'll have to rely somewhat on your predecessors as well, is it your impressions uh, that through the different administrations, uh, our commitment to simulation and modeling and the development of simulation and modeling has remained fairly consistent and funding has been stable. Uh, if anything, it's been increasing in an appropriate way. Or do you have the impression that as one administration comes in uh, and, and, and replaces another, all of a sudden the programs change, uh, the funding levels change, and we're on this roller coaster ride with regard to this critically important aspect of national defense? Uh, that makes it very difficult for industry to plan how to partner with government to actually effectively develop the kind of simulation and modeling uh, programs that we need. Are, are we sufficiently stable? Gentlemen. Let me start with that. May I, uh, go ahead. May I start, Bill? Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Congressman. Uh, uh, those are great uh, questions uh, related to the private sector and, and certainly in the healthcare situation and that we currently face in the United States now. Healthcare itself is certainly out of my, out of my lane, but I, uh, in terms of the utilization of simulation um, uh, in training of healthcare professionals, um, it is exploding within the, the country. Um, I think partly uh, because of the support that uh, we uh, in the private sector um, have, and in the healthcare uh, uh, industry specifically, have received from the Congress of the United States. Um, the MNS Caucus, Modeling and Simulation Caucus, the inception of that organization, that interest that was shown by the House of Representatives, was a watershed event for, uh, for the nation in terms of modeling and simulation is concerned. A watershed in, in event in the sense that it, um, it, it gave, uh, gave the community uh, the status that uh, we have uh, so long uh, desired to, to, to achieve. Um, but because of that, and the interest that it's developing, uh, here, in the, here in this hearing this, this morning, for example, uh, is I think it's, uh, uh, it's truly significant. Uh, it's caused many throughout the nation in different domains within our economy, uh, specifically in healthcare, to uh, focus a lot more attention of their and their own resources, not uh, not federal resources, but their own resources on development of simulation centers within hospitals and clinics across the nation. Mayo Clinic has a first-rate simulation center. There are hospitals in the Northeast that have first-rate simulation centers. The um, Medical College of Virginia uh, in uh, in uh, Hampton Roads has a simulation center. There's one that now in the Central Florida. As part of the uh, the new medical facility down in, in the Central Florida region, so it's growing by leaps and bounds. 
There's a new organization that was stood up about five years ago in the, in the country. It's called the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. It began with four people, an anesthesiologist, two nurses, and an uh, obstetrician. Um, could, that could has I, now grown to could, total about 2,500 2500 people. I find that very helpful. My t do you mind if I, um, I, I'm, I am though specifically interested in your impressions concerning the sort of steadiness administration to administration of uh, the program and the funding within DOD for modeling and simulation. Uh, I know that there's been an explosion of interest nationally in this, uh, and, uh, and I'm just wondering, are, are we, it's so difficult for private sector to partner with government when government is on a roller coaster ride from administration to administration. How do I, as an, an, an entity, uh, uh, partner with somebody who is flaky and can't be relied upon? Uh, so that the, my question specifically is, are we being consistent? Are we, be, are we predictable with regard to our investments and our programs? Thanks, sir, for the question. I don't detect any change from administration to administration in, in uh, funding. What I do detect, however, is that there are a bunch of things driving the desire for simulation now. And as an example of the first point I made, I, I said earlier I grew up in the submarine force. I remember reporting to my first submarine and going right to the, sub, the submarine simulator or the attack center simulator and working with the uh, crew to get proficient in that arena. So this, that was some 30 years ago. So we've, we've been using these uh, for a long time. Now, wh what I think is happening, happening is a recognition of fuel costs, and so a recognition that fuel costs are gonna go up, and so that's, that's certainly a driver for simulators. Um, if you use simulators, your, your operating costs will go down, you will have less wear and tear, therefore less maintenance, therefore greater operational availability at less cost. So all those things are working together. Um, and, but I would say that the other thing that's happened is it used to be in the Navy, for instance, community specific. Some communities would be more interested in simulators than others. And that's a cultural change that, that is occurring and now I know I work for a chief of naval operations that is pushing simulators. I know I work for a secretary of the Navy that are very interested in simulators. I don't think it's because of a political bent. I think it's because of the time. I think the technology is exploding. And so the combination of the technology, overcoming some of the cultural barriers, and the requirement to save both fuel costs and and produce uh, operational availability at less cost are driving the, the explosion in military use of simulators. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Whitman. Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the panel, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for your service to our nation. I do want to get a sense of how our modeling and simulation is being applied. And I know that uh, there's one dimension that it can assume, but I want to make sure too that there's, or under, understand that there's a balance there. And obviously modeling and simulation can help, but it can also take us down the road of more of a test-taking, outcome-based effort than it is to, to, to really simulate the realism of what our men and women in uniform will face. So just to ask the panel collectively, how are you all seeking a balance in the, the full training regimen and using modeling and simulation and to, to, to meet those needs and, and making sure that there's a balance, that, that we're not in a, in a quote unquote test taking realm, but that we are in a mix of simulating reality, but also making sure that there's a mixture of that, of that hands-on element that while modeling and simulation can do a lot, it, it's, it's not the be all and end all. So I'd like, like your perspective on how you all see that balance being uh, attained in integrating modeling and simulation into the, your force structure needs. Thanks for the question, sir. I, I think we were probably there a couple of years ago. By our own internal work, we figured out that, that maybe we had uh, 
become over-reliant on um, computer-based training, if you will, at some of, particularly at some of our uh, basic levels. Uh, so we have been striving to achieve uh, balance in that, that area. I would say today we've got about, in, in that school environment, we have about 8,500 instructors, and that results in a, a one to six instructor to student ratio, which, which uh, we'd love to have in our schools today. Um, but we believe in this blended learning concept, and, and, the, and the, so a mix of, of computer-based training and uh, live instructor. I think the, the one of the benefits of computer-based training is we find that uh, we find that the people will dig into areas on their own where they're not comfortable. They'll, they'll, they'll quickly pass by areas where they do have a comfort level and dig into, dig into some, some of those uh, more challenging levels for them. And that's, that may be different than what you find in a full classroom environment. So, so there are positives there. Now we've shifted to hands-on training for things like valve repairs, and uh, and then we also have developed some front panel simulators, which look like a diesel engine or look like uh, an oxygen generator, and you can go and push the buttons, and you get the noises and and actual uh, indications of a real simulator or of a real of the real platform, but it is a simulator. So it's, it's uh, I think it's a step in the right direction, but we do, as you suggest, recognize there's a need, a need for balance, and we're, and we're striving to achieve that balance today, sir. Good. General Layfield. Thank you, Congressman, and uh, thank you for your support to the military and their families, as indicated. I would like to uh, specifically um, uh, talk about computer-based training as we know it today, our, our virtual training, our online training, and our models and simulations. I do believe uh, that the early days of computer-based training uh, may have uh, been somewhat test-oriented. It may have been programmatic and lockstep. Uh, however, today's computer-based models and all of our learning uh, has grown so fast, our methodologies and how we learn, and that our modelings and our simulations associated with that are also growing, and we are learning from advancements in technology. I'll give you a specific example. Uh, we have online, uh, in conjunction with our services, developed a course that's called Virtual Culture Awareness Training. It's called VCAT for short. It is a place you can go. It utilizes modeling and simulations. You can go to it online from home station or forward deployed for that matter. But it immerses you in a set of challenges, a set of scenarios. It takes you to a place where you have to make decisions and it provides you feedback. And it allows you to see what happens when you maybe make the wrong decision. And it doesn't give you a test. And it doesn't give you a score. It gives you very clear feedback on how you're performing in this particular environment. And, it, and we find that to be very valuable. Thank you. Thank you. General Gibson. Uh, sir, I apologize. I may have misunderstood your question initially. I thought you meant the balance between test through modeling and simulation versus using it in an experiential uh, training uh, method. Well, that can certainly be one dimension of the question. Okay. If you'd li like to answer that dimension, that would be great. Sir, and I'll touch on the other in the sense that, yes, we use computer-based training throughout uh, and, and strike a balance with the hands-on training before final evaluation all the way through OJT uh, and supervision. But coming back, we are organized, obviously, as we bring new systems on board with, uh, from uh, corporate to developmental testing. Uh, which we explore how that better applies with a blue suit operator and in our scenarios, then to operational tests and evaluation, where again we take it to the next level of application uh, of new systems, introduce, introducing new systems, weapons, software. And finally, obviously, we use a lot of simulation in uh, every from steps of part task training where you just repetitively begin at the beginning, as it were, to where we do these networked operations that we talk about in a virtual environment. And uh, as I'd mentioned earlier in my testimony, especially today in many of our fifth gen uh, aircraft and systems, that's the only place that we will choose to operate and uh, use all those weapons and systems that are available to us. So a very expansive into the mission uh, testing and capability. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Admiral Burke, uh, this subcommittee uh, is uh, much aware of challenges that the Navy is facing in regard to manning, training, and maintenance of sur surface fleet ships. Could you please explain how the Navy's, Navy's response to those challenges would be reflected in the readiness uh, models? Yes, sir. The, uh, the way the readiness models work is they take a, uh, uh, a, a bunch of different inputs, and so all of them consider the force structure, they consider the schedule, they consider the training requirements and <clears throat> what happened in previous years. And then, depending upon which portion you're talking about, and in this case, I think we're talking about ship readiness models, then they take uh, specific steps to figure out what the cost requirement would be. So the model, the model simply responds to the, the database that we would have entered into it. So if we said in the case of surface ships that we now want to, we now recognize that we have not been doing enough maintenance on them and we raise the maintenance requirement, then that will raise the cost of, of doing business. Now that's easy to easy to understand, but it's it's not simple to figure out how much that cost requirement will change. So uh, additionally, if you put more people on board, then that will change the amount of maintenance that's being done by the ship, by the ship's force, and consequently should reduce the maintenance that's being done off the ship. So there's competing pieces in that, and the model will, will uh, take all that information in once we tell it what the, what the new requirements are and it'll give us a, give us a cost. Does that get at your question, sir? <clears throat> yes, but let me ask you now, when you take that it takes uh, some uh, steps to figure out that, how long does this uh, step that you have to take, how long does it take to get to the bottom of the problem that you're looking at? From a model perspective, sir, it's very simple. It's, it's changing a few inputs. The, the more challenging piece to this is determining what the actual requirement is. So if you decide that you now need to do much more maintenance on the ship, you have to figure out what that specific maintenance is. Does that maintenance mean we're going to open up some tanks and we're going to do some... Uh, repairs to those tanks? Does it mean we're going to do additional maintenance on pumps, valves, et cetera? That's the more challenging work, and that's the work that the Naval Sea Systems Command is doing now as, as they have completed several inspections of ships to know better what, what uh, areas will need additional work. Once they've done that work, it's... Uh, very rapidly, inside a day, we can, we can generate new uh, cost requirements, sir. Because I know that uh, throughout some of the hearings that we've had in the past, one of the problems is that even when we get new ships come aboard, some of them are rusted, the doors don't close. You, you know what I'm talking about. So we also need to see how we can, can correct that uh, because the taxpayers are paying a heck of a lot of money, you know, and we, we hope that we get what we're paying for. Uh, and sometimes I think that maybe we're not, uh, maybe we don't have in, enough personnel. Uh, but this is something that we need to look, uh, you know, forward to, to correcting all this. And I know that you're doing your best, but we're here to see also at the same time how we can help you to reduce some of this now, the next question that I have is what type of factors or events would require you, and I know you, you got into some of them, to require the, you to modify the readiness models. Uh, how quickly can the models respond to changing operational requirements? Yes, sir. 
once again, the models respond, will, will respond very rapidly to changing operational requirements. So what would happen in this case is COCOM X would require additional forces. We would, once those, that demand signal was adjudicated, then we would determine, we could easily determine what it would take to generate that requirement and what it would cost to do that. Now, you know, there's only so much you can do. I mean, you can't, you can't get blood out of the stone, but within reasonable parameters of the same force structure and the same training requirements, it's r relatively easy to generate that new cost requirement, sir. Another, ask another question before I yield to my uh, ranking member here, but during your testimony you stated that there was no direct connection between program steaming days and what was actually required to prepare for the for and execute the operational schedule. How have the uh, the models changed this and how is the change reflected in the Navy's annual budget submission? Sir, I'm not sure I heard the first part of your question. Could you repeat it, please? Yes, sir. Uh, and this was during your testimony, there was, di there was no direct connection between, and this is what you stated, between program steaming days and what was actually required to prepare for and execute the operational schedule. How have the models changed this and how is that change reflected in the Navy's annual budget submission? Yes, sir. In the past, there was no real connection between steam, there was, I guess I sh maybe I was too strong. There, there was a connection, it just wasn't, it wasn't as obvious as it, as it is today with the model. So what we would essentially say was, here's what worked last year. We need to generate about the same amount of, of presence. So therefore we'll, we need the same amount of steaming days or flying hours to do that. Now what we do is we start from the demand signal and we, we uh, once that's adjudicated, and then we, we use our, our FRP or Fleet Readiness Program to figure out, let's talk ships for a minute, to find out how much time the ship is gonna be in the basic phase, the intermediate phase, the sustainment phase, and the maintenance phase to produce that level of, of uh, presence or, reading, or presence at a particular readiness. And then from that, we go into the specifics of how much the fuel costs, how much the utilities cost, how much training costs, et cetera. And then that generates the number of uh, steaming days and the cost to do that. So it's, it's more than steaming days because some of that time is spent alongside the pier doing other training and we know, so that output at the end is based on all those different pieces for the, for the uh, force that we have. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty complicated, sir, and I know we've taken uh, some of your staff through it and shown them how it works, but it's, it's it's not real easy to explain. I'm trying to, no. I'm I'm trying to do my my best here. I, I know I know, and I know that uh, you always try to do your best. But and the reason I ask this is because in prior budget requests we have seen where the Navy has cut steaming days. Yes, sir. You, you know that. But I think that this is a very uh, part of the uh, of the training that needs to be done. So yes, when sir. you cut down, but I I, I hope and, and, and you know. We, we're here today because we, we're working together and we hope that, that with this simulation modeling can help us get to where we want to go by not only uh, protecting our sailors and Marines and soldiers, but also, you know, giving the, uh, the equipment that we utilize, utilize longer life because, sure. and save the taxpayers as much money as we can because I know that 
Secretary Gage came down not too long ago and said, we need to cut down. Yes, sir. You know, it's, it's not easy. Uh, it, it always comes to mind that, that we're concerned for the, the lives of these young men and women who are serving. We want to be sure that they have what they need so that they can survive these horrendous two wars that were involved. But sure. no, I, I know that you're doing your best, and we want to work with you, and, and, and any uh, ideas that you come to us so that we can help you let us know. Let me yield to my good friend, Mr. Forbes. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, and, and I'll be brief. I want to kind of follow up on what Mr. Marshall asked, and um, Jim, your question, I think a lot was on the uh, funding roller coaster that we've had, but it's more than funding. Um, and, and so the question that I would leave to um, all, all of you to respond to is, uh, how can uh, DOD be kind of a national leader in the prevent preemptive use of modeling and simulation so that we can respond to crisis situations. Is our current DOD um, governance such that it maximizes our modeling and simulation investments? But then the third thing, and this is what I was listening to as Jim was asking his question, are we giving the right signals to the industry as to what DOD needs in terms of modeling and simulation? Because it's not just the funding stream, but sometimes it's the industry is sitting out there saying, you want one thing on Monday and another thing on Wednesday. Uh, do we have a mechanism to be able to give a clear picture to industry, this is what we need and this is what we think we're gonna need over the next several years? And so I throw that out to any of you who wanna take a stab at that. Um, you know, how, how do we become that preemptive leader and uh, are we sending the right messages out to the private industry? Congressman, let me, let me take a stab at that from a Joint Forces Command and training uh, angle. Um, the bread and butter of what we do for an exercise when we deliver a mission, re a mission rehearsal exercise to the combatant commander for him to train on is relevance. And with respect to that, our modeling, our models and our simulations uh, need, need to deliver. They need to deliver relevant uh, simulations that replicate the battle space that they're operating in. Uh, with respect to that, uh, we have to spend and focus all of our, our efforts in the right direction, and there's no room for waste, of course. Therefore, uh, the requirements systems that we have inside Joint Forces Command with the services and with the Office of the Secretary of Defense uh, do in fact uh, provide us adequate oversight to, to lay out those requirements on the table and match the appropriate resources with it. And I want to thank you for supporting the President's budget in that respect. I have to say that subordinate to that at the flag officer and general officer level uh, where we meet in forums like a training community of interest or a executive board for the application of the $285 million for immersive training, uh, we meet frequently to make sure that our requirements are in balance and that they are delivered to the Office of the Secretary of Defense appropriately. As a matter of fact, today uh, I will attend a meeting uh, specifically with that in mind where I'll gather with other flag officers and general officers and SESers at OSD to discuss are we getting after immersive training with the resources we were, we were given. So, so thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss that from Joint Forces Command. Okay. A anyone else want to take a bite of that? Sir, uh, just briefly, um, I think uh, not to necessarily address the roller coaster, but as, as budgets uh, come and go, obviously uh, I heard the term earlier, culture. Uh, we have that uh, in our Air Force and DOD as we do anywhere, but as you begin to prioritize, as resources become constrained, obviously we we put a priority towards maintaining the aircraft and the actual systems because in the end that's what you'll go to war with. Uh, and so there is a tendency sometimes in those, those difficult challenges and uh, times that the simulation budgets will shrink or you'll delay uh, some of that concurrency that we talked about, keeping them relevant, and then that has a negative impact on the trainers' perceptions of the value. So I, I would just offer that as you begin to have budgets that become constrained, the first priority goes to the life fly and, and the actual systems and the maintenance of those, and then the simulation and the virtual environment sometimes take a 
take a second tier, and that's and, where I've seen the impact. And, General, one thing I would just throw out to all of you, and I think we're united on saying this, but, but I don't want to speak for my colleagues. It, it seems almost we should be doing the reverse. It seems like modeling and simulation of everything that we're utilizing, when budgets get tighter and things are tougher, modeling and simulation is the one vehicle that helps us navigate through those tight budgets. Um, also help us become more efficient and make sure that we have the readiness that we need. And so we need help from you as how uh, we continue that to make sure um, that we're not having that trimmed and cut. And Admiral Lewis, do you, do you have any comments on? <clears throat> yes, sir. Thanks, Congressman. The, uh, uh, one comment, um, and that is, as you described, uh, and, and we're looking at is the relationship between industry and, and government, specifically with DOD. Um, uh, for the most part, industry has a fairly good understanding of the requirements as they emerge from the, the different services and from the joint uh, apparatus that, uh, that we work with. Um, however, there uh, is always room for improvement. And uh, so we strive and work very hard on both the industry side and on the government side to have a continuing dialogue between the, the two, to ensure that both sides understands the art of the possible as far as the government is concerned, and that as far as industry is concerned, we have a full and complete understanding uh, of, the, um, of the requirement. Now, that dialogue ebbs and flows over time, and it, it, it depends on a number of different factors, but sometimes we've, we find the, the, the dialogue is hindered by regulation, restrictions, and so forth. Uh, and then there are periods when there's complete, open, and, and honest and forthright communication between the two sides. Um, but that's something we have to live with. We know that that occurs, and we have to deal with it. So I would say that for, for the most part, because of that dialogue, the interchange, and the, and the bridge that's provided by industry associations like mine to ensure that that communication is enhanced and continues to flow. Uh, I think that overall, though, we have an understanding of, of, of the way this system works, and, and uh, we go forward from there. Well, I want to thank all of you for your work. I'm going to yield back the balance of my time, but I also want to encourage you that even though the hearing technically will end in a few minutes, um, the, the record's still open, so we, we would love to have your responses or thoughts if you'd like to put anything in there that we can utilize to help uh, uh, with this industry and the great work all of you are doing. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Randy. Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have one, one quick question. I want to uh, kind of follow up on uh, Congressman Forbes' question to Admiral Lewis. I know as, as we talk to folks in the modeling and simulation industry, we talk about encouraging innovation, encouraging creativity, encouraging them to kind of push the envelope. Do you think that, number one, that the capacity is there for them to push the envelope, and do you think that they are doing that in such a way that precipitates thought amongst our service branches on what the future capabilities of modeling and simulation bring to the table? In other words, I see it kind of as a two-way street, not only the clear demand signal, but also the industry pushing the envelope so that the service branches can understand potentially what is out there and what's what the capabilities might be in the future and that and that hopefully that spawns innovation and creativity well th thank you congressman uh, for that opportunity but very very briefly just let me say that um the stimulation of innovation and creativity i think is uh, alive and well within the modeling and simulation industry and the the companies and corporations that are involved in that kind of activity um i'll give you an example and I know you've been to ITSEC. Thank you, sir, for your participation. We look forward to you returning again later on this year. But uh, at that event, we have about 500 exhibitors, and typically um, we have 100 new, 100 to 150 new exhibitors every year. So what happens between to those 100, 150 that are replaced each and every year? Well, most of them are small companies, um, small 20 to 25 personnel within a company, they've got one idea, they have, uh, this, this, is, this is America at, at its best when we see this kind of activity occurring. These, these people, these entrepreneurs with one good idea, uh, they showcase that idea at an event like ITSIC, for example, and they, uh, they either succeed and they go on, they get bought up, or sadly some of them uh, probably fail, but th that's alive and well 
that, that the ability, the, the, the capacity is there, the desire is there, and, and the intellect is there to, to go forward and, and develop the, these new things that, uh, are, that the services do find a value, even though they may not have had a, you know, uh, an overt requirement for that particular uh, uh, piece of capability. Thank you, Admiral Lewis. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, all of us have uh, experienced uh, your simulators. I've, I've been in a couple of Air Force simulators, uh, done a, one Army simulator. But I have to say, Admiral, that uh, uh, the, the naval simulator up at uh, Annapolis uh, was very helpful to the Navy, at least in one instance. A group of us from Congress uh, went up there on a Code L, pretty easy, just drive up to Annapolis, no big deal with the idea that we were going to be playing faculty and staff in baseball after the Codell. And right before we were going to go out and play the baseball game, you put us in a simulator, and half the team was seasick for the game. So I thought that was actually a pretty good strategy in the use of simulators. I uh, want to thank you all for what you do. It's terribly important, national defense. Uh, we need to fund you adequately, give you the kind of support that you need in order to do this. Uh, and with that, we're adjourned.